Good morning. Happy Father's Day. It also means Cheyenne's sixth anniversary. We got two anniversaries, actually. I probably told you the story before, so I won't tell it again. We have two anniversaries, and I guess depending on how busy we are, we choose which one we're going to celebrate. So today is Father's Day, and it's a great and wonderful day. Uh, many dads will probably be at Home Depot after this, checking out the sales, because that's where I'm going to be after I get my groceries. It is a wonderful day, and it, it was amazing the first time uh, I realized, you know, I knew I was a father, but actually soaking it in on Father's Day, and my dad texted me that morning, and it was a special moment for your dad to finally hand down uh, that great blessing to say Happy Father's Day. This morning, I'm going to continue on the lesson that was presented last week, and that lesson derived from 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter, the second chapter, starting in the ninth verse. This lesson is a lesson that is very serious, a lesson that uh, is brought up all the time when you're in some type of Bible discussion, the question will be asked or something related to it, and the church needs to be confident in their answer. They need to be able to present a grounded answer that may be able to change the life of that person. And yesterday we were doing some work for a lady while uh, some of Cheyenne's family or Cheyenne's uncle was cutting hay and his good friend, they were cutting hay and they stopped by and we had a pretty long uh, biblical discussion. He thought he discovered something that was, was going to change the biblical perspective. He ran across some article and we got to look, we got to look into that article and it amounted to nothing. It was some legend that there was some woman that was before Eve, and there was a woman that was actually created the same time man was. She turned out to be evil, turned out to actually be a demon, and then came Eve. And that all came, it's actually an interesting study, it all comes from the Hebrew word that means screech owl. And the way that it's pronounced is Lilith, and so they thought it was some person that was in the Garden of Eden. Anyways, pretty far-fetched. And so we got to study it, we got to looking at it, and I'd rather do that than the work that we are doing at the moment. And a good Bible discussion, great Bible discussion. We talked for a while, and actually every time I see these two when they're together, they're like two peas in a pod, uh, we're always talking Bible. And I'm hoping that the more we talk, the more it's going to lead them to obeying the gospel. And, and it's, it's the people that I pray for a lot and think about a lot. And so there was questions asked based on this topic. And one of the major things was uh, about sin, about how God could really forgive some of the sins that man has committed. Men and women that maybe try to commit genocide for a certain race or a certain people, could God really forgive that person? And I told them, yeah, God would forgive them. If he repented and obeyed the gospel, God would forgive him. Is it hard to accept? Yeah. He asked me if I knew my history. I said, I know my history. <laughs> and the people that done these things were very bad people. But I asked the simple question. I said, who did God die for? Or who did Christ die for? He had to answer all people. So what does that mean? That means all people have a chance to go to heaven. Now, will they take the chance? Not all people will. But the chance is there for all people. And so we kept studying different things and different ideas, and, and we always boiled down to the difference between where I go and where somebody else goes. What's the difference between where you go and where maybe my preacher's at? What's the difference? And so we looked a little bit that last week. We looked at the name makes a difference. The way we worship makes a difference. And the way lessons are being taught and, and the way that they are designed makes a difference. And so this morning, here in just a moment, we'll turn over to John. But first, I want to read First Peter chapter 2. I want to look here at verse 9. But you are a chosen generation. For those who are not aware of biblical principles, this means God looked down upon the nations and he chose one. And no longer Israel. Israel is not the chosen generation. That was one of the conversations we had. That individual thought Israel was still God's special people. No longer is that the case. Uh, the way I put it is they ruin their chance. And we can ruin ours too. 
So God looks down upon the nations, all the nations of men, and he says, you are a chosen generation. You are a chosen people. Chosen. So that means he picked out a group, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. For those who don't know what holy means, it is something that is set aside. Set aside from all other things. So he looked, he chose this people. Then he made this people a priesthood, able to offer up worship, able to offer up praise unto his name. And then he says, I'm going to make you separate from all others, all other nations, all other people. You're completely separate. It means no one is like you. No one can be like you. And you're not going to be like anybody else. Holy. That's holy. That's how we view God. We don't put God on any other level. We don't put him on the Muhammad level or the Buddha level or uh, uh, the Allah level. He is above all that because he's holy. He's God. We separate him from everything else. So we are a, a holy nation, his own special people. Uh, If you're getting the hint that there is a group, a group, your spotty instincts are telling you right. There's a chosen, there's a few, there's a one. There is a group, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, we were nothing. And the reason we were nothing is because there was a chosen generation and we were nothing. We were Gentiles. We are Gentiles. We are not Jews. We are not Israelites. That's why the Old Testament law is not even applicable to us is because it was only given to the Israelites. That's why that law is not to be obeyed and has been put away since that time. So I think about this section. I think about this uh, uh, area within Scripture and it's letting me know that there is a group there is a nation and we later learn there's a church out there that belongs solely to God and it's his and it bears his name and he is the founder he is the one who purchased the church he is the one who organized the building of the church the way it ought to to worship the way it ought to be God designed a church that way a kingdom that way we're not a people we're nothing now not really nothing but we're not a people we're not we're not special like the israelites were we're not getting this special treatments like they were but now in a different time he says that we are now the people of god who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy what a blessing what a joy that this exists a lot of people haven't found it And actually, Jesus said only a few is going to find this. But it is out there for everyone. Christ died for all people. All people have the chance to be his people. So turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and verse 32. John chapter 8 and verse 32 tells us that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You can know truth. That's one of the first things I want to present to you this morning as we get into the lesson, is that you can know truth. So you may be wondering, why is there so many divisions? Why is there so many different uh, uh, belief systems, doctrines, and creeds, and, and everyone's on their own road to heaven? Why is there all this? I want you to know, out of all the division in the world, you can know truth. And I believe if you're seeking truth, God is going to put truth in your path. That's my personal belief. I believe it very strongly. If a man is seeking after God, God's going to make it possible for him to find him. We see that with Simon. He was seeking after God, and God made it necessary that he found him. I think all people that have that desire will find truth, and that truth will set them free. That could be a journey of two days. That could be a journey of a year. That could be a journey for 50 years. But if you're seeking God, I believe you'll find him and you'll find the truth. And the truth is simple in reality. The gospel is very simple. Some have called it, when they preach the gospel, the simplicity of the gospel. It is so easy to understand what must be done 
to be obedient to Christ. He did not make it complex. He did not make it where we had to be of tribes or of a, a, a certain priesthood. He made it where you had to be born. You had to hear the gospel, obey the gospel. You're on your way to heaven. That's how simple it is to be a Christian. It is not something you have to trace your family lineage. You just have to be born. And then that chance is available to you. What a blessing it is. So, John tells us that we shall know the truth, and the truth can set us free. Acts chapter 2, I want to look here at verse 36, and we're actually going to come back to this towards the end of the lesson. Acts chapter 2, I want to get to Peter standing and facing his Jewish brethren and teaching them the gospel, the very first gospel lesson that was really taught in this particular way. Acts chapter 2. This is an amazing scene, something that would have been amazing to witness. He tells the Jews, therefore, let all the house of Israel know this means all the tribes from the south to the north. does not matter the divided kingdom, the united kingdom. All of Israel needs to know this very thing. What is so important that they need to know? Let Israel know as surely that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And there makes a difference right there between this group of people and maybe the people down the road. We believe Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Not just Lord and not just Christ, but both Lord and Christ. That puts Jesus on a pretty high level. Puts him on a pretty high scale. And there are certain groups of people today that believe that Jesus is not Lord nor Christ. He is not God. He is not divine, but he is a created person by God the Father. And that group of people will argue you tooth and nail. I've been part of the arguments before, the discussions before, but that makes a difference between us and a lot of people on how they view Jesus. So I'm going to believe in Scripture, and Scripture clearly says that Jesus is now both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, this was a shock to the Jewish nation. Shocked them. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and Peter and the rest of the apostles said, Men and brethren, uh, what shall we do? How can we fix this issue? Because Peter told them they crucified him. They crucified Jesus. And the Jesus that they crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ, and it pierced them in the heart because they realized they went against their father. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized. And what's neat about this section is he told the group of the Israelites to repent because they all committed the same sin and they committed it together. So they both, or they all, needed to repent. And look at the wording of Peter. He says, let each one of you be baptized. One could not be baptized for the whole. So each one had to go down to the water that day and be immersed. That was the command given. And if you're thinking, well, that sounds different than where I go, you're right, because that is a difference. We believe in repentance, and we believe in immersion. When we believe this because of what we read, we don't believe this because some man started this group. We don't believe this because we have some creed book. We believe this because Scripture teaches us clearly the way to be saved. And that's one of the big differences between the Church of Christ and other places. And to mention, I may have mentioned it before, I don't do these types of lessons to be mean or to belittle anybody. All of my family, 100% of my family that I know exists is outside the body of Christ. So I take it serious. So they will hear these lessons on this day. You think they like it? I don't know. They may not even recognize what I'm saying. And I don't do this to be mean, but I do this partly to cause some upsetting in your life. Because if you get upset by hearing Scripture, that means you actually listened to that Scripture and you took it in. And in some area of your life was opposite of what the Scripture said. That's a good thing. That's a good thing that you get those feelings. I get frustrated too sometimes hearing the Scripture and reading and knowing that I'm doing the opposite of what it says. It makes me upset. But it motivates me to do something better. And so if you find something that is different. Oh, this ain't what I was taught. This ain't what I do. But here's what it says. You need to find out really what it's saying and make sure you're doing what it says. So if we have 
men like Peter and men like Paul and men like Jesus, man and God. And also we got John the Baptist. We got a lot of people preaching about immersion. There must be some indication that immersion is important, right? Okay, maybe it's important, but maybe it's not essential to salvation. That's a big deal. Oh, you are saved and then you're baptized. Huge deal. I was raised that way. That was a big deal. I've been baptized three times in my life. The first, two, first one, don't really remember. The second one, our youth leader, I'm being honest with you. The youth leader where we went and Jasper told us this group of youth kids needs to look better. We need to have some baptisms. That was the reason I was baptized the second time. <laughs> Do you think that was a good baptism? Uh-uh. I just wasted my time and got dunked under the water. Now, my third one. That's the one that made sense to me. And the reason it made sense to me is because I was hearing it straight from book, chapter, and verse. There was no persuading that needed to be done. I was not like King Agrippa. I was not persuaded. He was persuaded, almost persuaded to be a Christian. No one was persuading me. No one was trying to bribe me. It was the Word and the truth of the Word led me to the conclusion I need to obey this system because I need to be saved. So, I look at what men and what women are saying, especially on this day, and I try to connect what they say with Scripture. If it lines up, it lines up. If it doesn't, I try to find out what makes them come to that conclusion. What makes them teach something that is not in the Bible? How can someone get to that point? How can someone read about the power of God and the wrath of God that, that's going to come upon those who are disobedient? How can someone read what it says, prepare a lesson, stand up like I'm standing up, and then teach the complete opposite? How can that even be done? How is that even possible that that can happen? It is, it's not God's fault, because that was one of the discussions yesterday. He says, well, I read the Bible, I'm probably going to look at it differently than you. I said, don't. Don't look at it differently. Look at it with what it says. Because it says what it says. If I go to a Bible uh, uh, study, and we're reading the same book, what conclusion should we come to? The same conclusion. Because once we start thinking... Well, I'm reading this different than you. That ain't the scripture's fault. That's your fault. Or it could be my fault. Have I ever misread something? Yeah. Have I ever read something into the text because I wanted it to be there so bad and it wasn't there? Yeah. I have. There was certain topics that I wanted to make sure that passed for this lesson. And so I was reading and I read into it. And I, I wouldn't even realize that I was doing it. Until I actually sat back, read my lesson, I realized I read into that verse something that was not there. Had to be honest and take it out. So, there's a big difference between the way we view salvation and the way the denominational world views salvation. And, and I'm aware of it. I grew up in it. I hear it. I see it every week. See it on TV. Hear it on the radio. It's there. There is a drastic difference between the church and the denominational world. And it needs to be addressed. And people need to know that this has been going on since the church was started. Before the church was started, it was already being picked apart, the kingdom of heaven that was at hand. So, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 2. Just a moment. So, if you want to flip there. Go ahead and get it marked. It'll be the only verse we'll read in the Old Testament this morning. Daniel 2, verse 44. But I want to deal with three major topics that are presented every Sunday, every Wednesday. Some people have church on Tuesday night, Thursday night. Here's three. This is how you boil it down. Saved by grace. Saved by works. Saved by faith. That's the three major differences within the denominational world. They'll believe grace alone saves you. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5. Ephesians the second chapter and the fifth verse. This is one of the most popular saved by grace. I hear it a lot when I'm in Bible discussions up where I live because a lot of people where I live believe that way. I have three on one. 
one time. Three against one. Teaching me that at the same time. All three talking at the same time. And I was literally in a corner, sitting in a chair in a corner. They had me backed up. Couldn't even really say a word. Letting me know that they're saved by grace. And I didn't really get the chance to get a good word out. So I just listened. And I listened. I knew they were wrong. But I listened anyway. Because I really wanted to hear what they had to say. So here's the verse. Ephesians 2, verse 5, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. There you go. There's the doctrine of grace only. Right there, right here. We read it, right? I'm reading it to you in black and white that we're saved by grace. Now, why would I say that that thought is wrong? What word did Paul not use? He did not use alone. He said, yeah, I am saved by grace. I could end this lesson today and say, uh, uh, come forward and be saved by God's grace. And I would not be in the wrong. Because it is God's grace that saves you. The grace of Christ's sacrifice, something I did not deserve. I do not deserve to hear the gospel. I do not deserve to believe in the gospel. I do not deserve to have the chance to repent of my sins, nor confess the glorious name of Christ, nor be baptized for remission of sins. I don't deserve any of that. At all. I am dirt. I am sinful flesh. I am man. And I do not deserve those things. But here they are. God's grace. And I'm saved by that system. That system is what caused me to change my life. Works is a big one. Saved by works. There are several different groups of people that believe they are saved by good deeds. Now they do good things. But they don't believe in the grace part. They don't believe in the faith part. Just be good. Do good. Help the poor. Help the widows. Help the children's home. Give money. And you'll go to heaven. Smooth sail. Faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of Christ. Or the power of God. Romans chapter 1. But really look at verse 17. It says, for, it is, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. There we go. They should not live by works. So this has nothing to do with the grace. But they use this to say they will not live by works. They will live by faith. So I was at the dentist a while back. <laughs> every time I have a discussion with my dentist, and this dentist wears a bow tie for those who may know who I'm talking about. And the assistant, when he left the room, we had a pretty, we talk Bible every time I'm there. And the assistant told me, well, he believes in works only. I said, okay, thanks for the heads up. Now I've got some ground to work with. She said, well, I believe in grace only. I thought, oh my goodness. Okay, so I got one here, one here, and I'm in the middle. They got uh, sharp utensils, they got gas, they got all kinds of things. So what I do is I listen. I don't cut them off. If they start on some biblical thought, I let them go. I want to listen to what they have to say because I want to understand how that person comes to that conclusion. No, I'm completely different. I don't believe neither side. I believe they're both wrong. And the reason I believe that is because of Scripture. Not because some man taught me, not because I don't like those people. It's because I read, I listen to scripture, and I believe scripture, and I compare it to the world. And it's okay that things are wrong and things are right. I know we're living in this cushioned society today that all kids are winners. It's one of the big deals right now. You're always right. No, you're not. Kids win and kids lose. My son plays teeny ball. He, they're not keeping score. But if we got less kids than they do, guess what? We lose. <laughs> now, I don't tell my son that yet because he don't even comprehend what winning and losing is much. When he gets older and they're keeping score and he doesn't get a trophy at the end of the year, he's going to realize he's lost. Now, what's that going to do for him? Yeah, it may hurt his little heart, but what's he going to do? He's going to get better. He's going to get faster. He's going to get stronger so he can win. That's the point of winning and losing. We live in a cushioned society that everybody is right, especially in the religious world. You can do whatever you want and go on into heaven. They cushioned Christ and cushioned Jesus, and they make him out to be something he is not. 
So, guess what the church believes? And I hope you believe it because it's true. Ephesians chapter 2, and let's start here in verse 8. Ephesians 2, and let's look here at verse 8. I believe that you're saved by grace, you're saved by works, and you're saved by faith. Not in any particular order, I guess. I mean, I guess there is an order, but don't have it on my mind. For by grace you have been saved. Awesome. Man-made doctrines have been started on this verse. Okay? For by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. So now there's two things involved in salvation. Grace and faith. And not of yourselves, okay, it's not me. I did not design the plan. I could not save myself. No way. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. What a wonderful gift. Not of works. Okay, well, preacher, you just said you believe in all three. You just told the congregation you believe that faith, grace, and works saves. But Paul says what? Not of works. So am I contradicting? I sound a little contradicting here. Lest anyone should boast. That's a certain type of work. Now, for now, or for we are his workmanship. We are a prized possession of God. Created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. So the works that I do should not be works that I boast about. If I baptized somebody last week, I don't need to come here bragging and saying, what's your score count? Not boasting. I am created to do good works, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Where are the good works being done? The good works are being done in or in for God. Not for self, not for anybody else, but for God. So, if you want to know one of the biggest differences between the Church of Christ and a a, a denomination you may want to name, it's going to be somewhere in the realm of this right here. The way of salvation. If you have any questions on that, feel free to ask me. I am open arms when it comes to this. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, we have Daniel, and he is giving an explanation of a pretty wild dream. A dream concerning a statue that actually history shows us deals with different nations. Nations, we have the Babylonians, who he says, and this is how we know this, is he says that uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold, the Babylonian nation. Babylonian Babylonian nation was twofold. You had a stationary Babylonian nation, and if you have a pretty complex map in your back, you'll see that over time Babylonia was also a moving, devouring army. He says, you are that head. You are the head of gold. And then we go down to the Medes and to the Persians. I believe I have this right. I may be wrong. And from the Medes and Persians, we have the Grecians. From the Grecians, we have the Romans. And here at the Roman nation, the feet uh, in the statue, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, and he says, in the days of these kings, God will set up a nation that will never be destroyed or a kingdom that will never be destroyed. If something will never be destroyed, is it physical or, or is it spiritual? Spiritual. Because he tells us that all things of the world and the works of it will be burned up. So if it was a physical nation, what would happen to it? Burn up. Done. Done away with. So if it goes on forever, what is it? Spiritual. Spiritual kingdom, which will never be destroyed. Never be destroyed. So, if history is right, which I hope it is, Because if it's wrong, we are really messed up on Daniel chapter 2. Who was in charge during the days of Christ? Who ruled the known world? The Romans. I believe that we could go back to our historians and say they're right. I think history shows that. So, in the days of these kings, okay, so sometime during the ruling of the Roman nation, 
the eternal kingdom would be set up. Okay? Has the Roman nation passed? So has it been set up? If it hasn't been set up, what did God do through Daniel? He lied. And that would make God non-existent. Because if God lied, he actually doesn't even exist. For it's impossible for him to lie. So, I look at verses like this and I start thinking. And actually, me and Ty were talking about this morning. Back there in the room. This is a difference. The outlook of the church. The way the church is viewed. How many of us are guilty of making the statement, we are going to church? I say that all the time. Church is on Sunday. Church is on Wednesday. Church is on Thursday. Church is on Saturday. That's actually an incorrect statement. We really should not say we're going to church because what are we telling other people where the church is located? At that spot. If this building is empty, is the church here? No, it's just a building, right? This building could really be used for anything and everything. It doesn't take away from the church. Now, we don't let everything happen here, but we still hold this place to a value. It is something special to us. It is a common meeting ground, but it is not the church because the church is much bigger than four walls and a baptistry behind me. A church is on a lot bigger scale. The church is universal worldwide. You can go anywhere in the world and there can be the church. Now, I myself am not the church by myself. When I am with the brethren and we are together, we do make up the body of Christ. Now, I represent the church wherever I go, no matter where I'm at. I'm representing the church of Christ because I am a Christian. I'm Christ-like. I bear his name. Just like my wife, wherever she goes, she represents me. Wherever I go, I represent her. That's the same relationship with you and Christ. No matter where you're at, whatever situation you're in, you're representing Christ. That's why you need to watch what you say. That's why you need to watch what you wear, the way you act. You always should be on your toes because someone is watching you and waiting for you to fail so they have a reason not to be a Christian. You always have to watch your life. And being on guard on your life will change someone else's life. And look at Matthew chapter 3. What is the name of the church? One of the uh, adjectives of the church, descriptive terms of the church. We find this in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew, the third chapter, we have John the Baptist. He is one who is speaking in the wilderness, and he is preaching about the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So there is a kingdom that was going to come from heaven. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 7, we have Jesus talking with his disciples, and he says, go out and preach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16 and following, he tells Peter and the rest of the apostles, he tells Peter that he will give him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. There's something special about the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And Peter was the one in Acts chapter 2 that was standing up and declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he opened up a door to Christ. He had the keys. Keys are used to unlock something that was not accessible before. We could not access the kingdom of heaven. We could not access the mercy of God. There are some things about God that were not accessible. And the list really goes on and on. There's a lot of things about God that the Jews could not even be a part of. But now the doors have been opened. The doors have been opened for all people, all nations, all languages. There's no language barrier. There's no uh, color barrier. It is a nation back in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 that would consume all other nations. We view the church in such a different way than the world. Actually, I dare to say we're the only ones that view it in this way. And you know why we view it this way? It's because I read it. That's all it takes is to read. Actually, you don't need any commentaries. You don't need any creeds. You don't need any of these things. The Bible explains itself. Now, is it helpful To have commentaries, yeah, but you don't need them. You can go through life 
without a commentary. Because he's designed it for you to verbally hear truth. Romans chapter 10. To hear it. He's made a way for us to understand it. I dare say we're the only ones that view the church in this manner. So how do we differ? I have a long list of things. I've thought of a lot of things concerning this topic. But I'm not going to deal with them all. Because it's hard to deal with a lot of things at a short time. So, I think about myself. I want you to think about yourself. Are you different from the world? One thing I never want to happen is our church to be compared to a denomination of the world. Oh, they're like this church down here. Uh, I don't want that to happen. I don't want to be able to be comparable to anybody else. Because, and the reason is, is not because we're snobs, not because we're better than anybody else. The reason is because we are holy. Holy, that means different. Set aside. I can't, see, I can't compare God to anybody else. I can't compare Jesus to anybody else. I can't compare the Spirit to anybody else because they're holy. So, if the church is holy, should we be compared to a denomination down the road? And, and I may sound like some brat saying this. I may sound like some nose up to the ceiling saying this, and that's not the way I want to come across, just so you know. I'm saying this is because I think a lot of people are not realizing the church is different. Uh, and I know it's different than a lot of places just by looking at you know, what's going on and how we actually attract people to the building and what we actually do to, to make that happen. That's a huge difference. We're not going to go there this morning. So, as an individual, you want to be different. You want to stand out. Maybe it's in your workplace. You want to be, uh, you know, partly you want to be better than your, your co-worker because maybe you want the promotion. So you do extra work. You make sure the boss knows that you're standing out. We do that in our family. We want our kids to succeed. We want our kids to get the awards at the end of the year. We want our kids to do these things. We want our kids to stand out. Why wouldn't we want that for the church? Why wouldn't we want the church to be like the city that's on the hill that you cannot look away from? It's there all the time. Anybody can see it. And it's the only one on the hill that makes it unique. See, there's no other houses on that hill. Just like us, we are a light that shines into a world. We are a beacon of hope. We need to outshine every other belief system. Because Jesus says, I am the way to the Father. And if Jesus established the church, that means the church plays a part in the way to Christ, which leads you to the Father. We need to outshine the other systems of belief. We need to be a beacon of hope and truth and love and acceptance. But by using the standard of Scripture, that's where it all goes back to our standard. So if you feel that you have steered away from the standard of Christ, I mean, do not be ashamed to, to admit to a person that you've done something that's wrong. We've all done something that is sinful. Uh, that man asked me the other day, he, he said, you don't believe good people go to heaven? I said, I don't believe in good people. There is none good. No, not one. The only person good is God. I am not a good person. I try my best to be good, but I will always commit sin. I will always do something wrong. Maybe not all the time, but I will. I will fail my wife, my kids. I will fail God. I'll fail you, I will fail. There's no righteous. I said, none's righteous. There's none righteous but God. A lot of people, it's hard to accept that. I've accepted who I am. I think it's made me a better person. Accepting that you're going to sin will really change your outlook on your relationship to God. Hey, I know I'm going to sin. At some point in time, I know I'm going to do wrong. But thank Him for the system that He has set up that allows you to be forgiven and allows you to have a better heart, better motivation to never do those things again. You have been given the opportunity this morning to take advantage of God and of God's people. 
And I desire you take advantage of that and don't worry about moms, dads, brothers, and sisters. You worry about you and God. Make sure you leave here this morning knowing that if something were to happen, that you're on your way to heaven rejoicing, rejoicing, and rejoicing. You are the only one that will stop yourself from eternal life with God. No one else can stop that. And you have the opportunity this morning to t for that to take place. So Brother Rick has a song that I hope will encourage the minds of all to make sure their life is right and to make sure their life is different and that their life is dedicated to God. So Brother Rick.